How did you start in music? Well, I started with the bass. <laughs> Never a DJ. My name's Baby Doc, and this is Never a DJ. Join me where I speak to the innovators and originators of the clubbing world, talking past, present, and future. Never a DJ. Where are we now? Now we are now we are at the Changes Studio Berlin, owned by Garrett Frerichs. Uh, you might know him from You Made. He also was one of the guys behind Loops and Things, together with Jens Smartstedt, uh, Eternal uh, Classics and Superstition Records, and which I remixed. Yeah, you did. You put your hands on it too. You I gave did, it so your baby dog touch. And now we're going to touch some of the in instruments inside Changes Studio, which is owned by my good friend Garrett. Come on. Welcome! It's quite a setup. It's quite a setup, and uh, well, it felt, feels very professional in here. It, it does indeed. <laughs> and very cozy as well. It, it, some, some studios have a feeling they can feel like a lab, and th this isn't so when you have a Klingon sitting over here. Yeah, and uh, you know, Garrett put in here. All his experience and love of 30 years of music, plus some of the nerd stuff too, so yeah. Look, no leads. <laughs> Never a DJ. What kind of style are you playing? You're DJing at the moment. Techno. Techno uh, with a little splice of uh, melodies, of course, because I, I always love to have this. Uh, beats for your body and uh, sounds for your mind. What's your favorite length of set you like to play if you, could, if you have the perfect time? It really depends on the location, actually. So when you play on a on a huge event, a rave or something, one and a half to two hours is usually enough because then you really want to deliver uh, like a lot of peak time stuff and uh, keep the vibe on a high level. When you play in a smaller club where you can take go go more on a journey with music, right? Uh, then uh, some, then I would love to, I always love to play longer, like four hours or so, which is because uh, then you can play out stuff which is not so easily hitting, but um, you can, you know, do a journey and introduce music to people that uh, they will fall in love with when they get the chance to listen and dance to it. And uh, of course, it needs to be um, introduced well and for that you need time a longer set yeah. but those are the most rewarding sets i would say for me as well as for the audience Never a DJ. so here we are sitting by the canal we've got dogs coming past us the lady um tell me what, we, what, what your plans at the moment moment on future plans well, I'm working on different projects. One project, of course, is new recordings for my label Microglobe. The other uh, project is re-releasing stuff that has been released on labels, which is not digitized yet, not, not digital available on streaming services. 
So uh, the, for that, I have the label environment and environmental records. And um, is this your own label? Yeah, I'm doing this together with the superstition guys. And um, yeah, I just came come come back from a, a great session that I did with Tom Wax mm -hmm. in Darmstadt, where we uh, did like three tracks in three days, oh, which great. was amazing. And, and what uh, kind of style are they? Uh, pretty. Diverse, I would say. Uh, you know, diversity is key at the moment, and uh, it's like one is a is a, is a real banger called "Bang the Bass." The other two are also like 130-ish uh, speed, speedy techno tunes, but not as banging or hard. One is even more like a well, chilled, mm -hmm. tech housey vibe. But um, yeah, I, li I love them all. And uh, yeah, you, when we play tomorrow at uh, at the Weiser Hase, then you will probably uh, hear them because I'm going oh, to play looking, them. I'm looking forward to hearing them. I mean, we've got to say that both. Hold on. We've got to say both myself and Mike were going to go into the studio with at uh, your house in the country. That was a, the day where we were supposed to, but, but uh, found something different and better. Yes, exactly. Well, we're playing in Berlin tomorrow night. But we were also put off by the German train engineers who went on strike. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. You ruined our art. <laughs> but, but I hope you get your favorite one. Tell me about your first gig in Berlin. First gig in Berlin. Um, I think, well, that was the... Uh, in 1990, uh, the wall was already down and uh, there was a party... Uh, organized by the label Low Spirit, um, which was Le West Ham's label. And uh, I actually did my first EP on Low Spirit, so mm -hmm. I was assigned as a live act. Yeah. How long did you play for? I think it was half an hour or so. The lineup was amazing uh, because you had a DJ, a certain DJ called Moby. Oh, hey. You had <laughs> LFO, who were spectacular back then. You had Mixmaster Morris. You had a hippie, a homeboy in a funky dread, I think. And uh, Peter Dow from New Group from, from America. And uh, of course, Westbam was playing too, I think. Uh, I, I would have to look up the flyer. However, so we brought um, basically our whole studio on stage with the Atari and the mixer <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. So um, those are the days before laptops where you absolutely. could just go on. So we had, you I know. Don't, I don't know if the, I don't think the young people know how lucky they are not to have to carry about 18 flight cases wherever Absolutely. they went. Absolutely. I mean, I also remember when I had like a more, a more sporty life equipment in the early 90s uh, with an ASR-10 sampler, which was already that huge yeah. and uh, super, super heavy, plus a rack and rack solution with a Mackie mixer and effect drag, whole stuff and flight cases weighed uh, mm -hmm. well over 120 kilo, like mm -hmm. 240 pounds. Mm -hmm. the, you and go on by yourself? By yourself? Yeah. And you had to set it up yourself, no roadies? <laughs> well, uh, that what, that's what I needed for, uh, for my live performance. That wasn't, wasn't really much. It mm -hmm. was yeah, a sonic sampling keyboard with a sequencer inside. Mm -hmm. It was a 909, a 303. I think that was, that was it. And then, you know, just playing with these uh, sequencers, uh, mixing on the Mackie mixer, mm. a bit delay, a bit reverb. Yeah. That's all. I mean, everything you have in a laptop and in, in, in a door right now. When did you buy your first 909? Was it been 94 or 93? I was so excited. But actually, someone gave it to me who owed me some money. And they turned up the studio and just go, like, here you go. <laughs> I mean, but, um, but each 909 had a different sound. Same with 303s. That's, that's what they say. Uh, also, I heard that um, 808s seems, seem to be more laid back or more forward, like pushing a dragon, yeah. the beat. And, um, well, I think, I think my 909 was a good one. Yeah, my, my 9 was great. I mean, but probably everyone thought that, didn't they? But my 303, I had a couple of 303, 303s. Two were really weedy sounding, and one was just like heavy metal, which came from uh, Chicago. It was bought on the street corner in Chicago. 
and um, had like proper like like bass lines, dum 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 dum, on it before before I got my hands on it. That was well, that's what it was built for originally, you know. Yeah, I think I think I paid two hundred fifty dollars or two hundred fifty pounds. I can't remember what it was, and that's what so I think they going for four grand now, aren't they? Absolutely. Now, the the interesting thing about for certainly for some of the younger people that don't know about Berlin, its history, and the war, could you give a quick little rundown for what the political system was like and how it affected DJs on East Germany and West Germany? Mm, well, difficult question there. I just <laughs> it's a difficult it's an easy question, but it's uh, it's difficult to find a short answer. I moved here when the wall was still there and uh, nobody would have thought that it would go down uh, like that, just like that, with no stress, no casualties, no violence. That was a pretty amazing, pretty amazing uh, peaceful revolution that, uh, again, that you don't find in, in history often, I would say. Uh, living in West Berlin was interesting because it was an island in the middle of the of a red communist ocean <laughs> and um so there was a the nightlife was great but uh and there were, were also already the first asset house parties that i went to um what were they were these completely illegal these parties some of them were just up of parties however you also have to imagine or uh, or uh, to, to, not, to notice that uh, in Berlin there was a there was a lot of freedom, probably more freedom to be found than in West Germany, because there was no closing hour. Uh, the city was under Allied law, but uh, the Western Allies didn't really bother much uh, when about uh, about parties in warehouses or so. Of course, the Berlin Senate would, but it was um, it was basically uh, you know warehouses where of bars where you would find yeah. asset house parties until until it became a trend, and then even discotheques would host asset house parties for was for a summer or so. Yeah. And um, you told me once about that that when the wall came down, there were suddenly all these abandoned buildings. Yeah. That you could just take over. Yep. Did you do such a thing? I didn't know. Uh, but, um, I mean, for parties, of course, yes, there were many abandoned buildings that people would just go in and uh, do a party or throw a bar or do whatever until someone would come who claimed that he owns it or some authority uh, would come and... Uh, Ask what, what what they are doing there. I I did a bit of squatting myself in in the late eighties. Well, we we used to, we used to, so lots of they've all been in London. They've all been turned into either knocked down or turned into posh apartments. But back then, the late eighties, early nineties, they were empty because they were worthless. No one wanted them. So we used to all, all break in, set up a few studios, and like live there till they eventually kicked us out. Now that sadly. They've, all those buildings have gone now. They've all been knocked down. You told me once about old ladies take, taking a vinyl from East Germany to West Germany because they were the only people allowed to wear. Yeah, not not only vinyl, but also also te technical gear like tape decks or even even keyboards like the. <laughs> When the Cork Poly 800 came out, mm -hmm. it was fairly cheap for a polyphonic keyboard. So that was something, and it also, also looked like, like a plastic toy in a way. Yeah. So that was easily to be taken over by grandmothers to their, to, to their family members uh, in, in, uh, in East Germany, in East Berlin. And also, I mean, and if, even if the, the, the family member was not a musician, he could sell it in there for a great amount of money, of course. It's like smuggling 
Levi Jeeves, the Russians. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's uh, that's what a lot of people did. And uh, my like my um, former label boss, Mark Reader from MFS Records, he describes in his uh, in books and in podcasts also how um, they were smuggling complete complete DJ equipments over to the to East Berlin in the trunk of a of an American soldier's car <laughs> because American soldiers could not be searched at the border because they were Allied forces. So, Mike, explain this place. It's its significance in the, your history and the history of techno in Berlin. It's a big, history, a big significance actually because this used to be the Fischlabor. Fischlabor being the hangout of uh, DJs in the late 80s and, and early 90s. It was run by Dimitri Hegelmann, yeah. who uh, also created the UFO Club and later Trezor, and then Trezor to Zero, where we just been yesterday. And we had a fantastic time. Fantastic time. Yeah. And uh, so this was a place which was actually more like a bar, but you would always have DJs playing here for like 30, Deutschmarks and free drinks. Mm -hmm. So, like behind that top window window here, uh, DJs like DJ Clay, Alan Alien, myself would play their first so-called house sets because we wouldn't play banging, but more like what we consider to be more relaxed music, early FX twin, also some ambient stuff, but also house stuff, house tunes, or classic Detroit, and. Um, this was actually also in 89, I remember for hearing here for the first time about the plan to make a love parade, which was uh, invented by several people around being with Dr. Motta being the key person and some other people who were also, um, also supplied ideas, uh, make sure you, that it's you at the first love parade. <laughs> I was not in Berlin. Uh -huh. I had an appointment with my frisbee, <laughs> my ultimate frisbee team. Uh, we, we had to play a tournament in you West were Germany. A frisbee player? Yeah, yeah I, I like that a lot. Uh, in those days, I, I thought football is too, well, not elegant enough. So I am not, not uh, rebellious enough. So I, I, I preferred ultimate frisbee. And uh, we had this tournament in Western Germany, and I knew that there was going to be the street parade, but uh, like it was like 150 people, and they were already collecting tape, DJ tapes, so that they would, could play DJ tapes from those floats or from those trucks. And um, yeah, I was sorry that I couldn't join that, but then on next Monday I would also come here again, and everybody would be talking like how great that was. Monday would would usually the day where we all would meet here, DJs would tell uh, when they have played some somewhere out, outside of Berlin would uh, talk about how the club scene is in in uh, West Germany or or then after the opening of the wall in East Germany and uh, so this was kind of the the place where we would uh, exchange ideas, concepts and uh, also uh, people told me about the first love parade, how great it was, and uh, they, they definitely going to do it again next year. And I told them, yes, but then I will be there. And so I was, like I was joining every love parade in Berlin ever since. Never a DJ. So tell me, for, um, tell me about going on tour to different countries, how it feels to wake up in a different country every day. First of all, it's a big privilege, you know. People like your music so much that they even bother to buy you a plane ticket for, uh, to play for them in their country and uh, obviously know your records. Uh, and uh, this is an amazing, an amazing feeling. Even was amazing already in the 90s when there was no internet yet. People knew your records because other DJs must have played them or they bought them in their record stores. So it was amazing. And I always took advantage to take some time to, to you know, just discover a bit of the country. Also, the great thing is like 
when you when you're a tourist in countries like Japan, Vietnam, Australia, you just um, scratch on the surface of things, right? Like a tourist would do. And uh, the people there living there, they know exactly the good places, the good bars, the good the good pubs, and they know exactly the good restaurant to take you out. And uh, so that's always a big privilege. And uh, also, which I find most important is uh, created friendships, bonds between people. I was thinking like if people, if everyone could have the experience to travel other countries and make friends in other countries, there would be lesser violence, there would be lesser wars, there would, you know, people would have a better understanding of how privileged you are when you uh, have friends all over the world, like good friends uh, that share a common, a common uh, love for something like music and not just for a nation or whatever, like a thing which is most important for us to be together is to know each other and to share something peaceful that we all love. And club music turned out for me to be that thing, which is also the spirit of Chicago house music, of course. You may be black, you may be white, you may be Jew or Gentile. You're all welcome in our house. And with that, Mike, thank you very much for the first Never a DJ part one with Mike, the wonderful Mike Van Dyke. And you guys never miss Never DJ, okay? <laughs> Never a DJ.